globally, uh, the Pet Diaries app next week globally, and another app on its way in August um, in Australia, New Zealand, the US, Canada, and soon to be UK. I still have no tech skills whatsoever, so that's part of the discussion that we'll have today, is about getting the right people around you at the right time. Um, so we'll get started, um, talking about the journey of my startup. And what I've said there is, it's all about planning, from my perspective, planning, partnerships, pivots and prayers. We have all heard about the value of death um, for entrepreneurs, and I think most startup stories have those really dark times. So at no point in time will I say to you it's all roses because it is certainly a roller coaster ride. Um, and I will be talking about that today as well. So how did it start, the app gap? Firstly, in 2012, I had my second child. That's a photo there of myself with my two boys in 2012. You can see my youngest gets his thighs from me. He um, is 11 years younger than Jacob. When I had the eldest in 2001, it was a time when we used to use our mobile phones to make phone calls. We didn't have apps. We used to write everything down on paper. So for those of you who have children, um, you'll know that when you have a baby, you pretty much keep track of everything. So you write down when they have their feeds, when they have their sleeps. If you're breastfeeding, you keep track of which side you fed from last. Um, in the day, we used to put uh, a hairband on our hands before we had apps to keep track of which side we fed from last. And we would keep track of sleeps and milestones to make sure they were doing all the things in the right order. It's actually really important. Things like making sure they crawl before they walk. Um, children that don't crawl before they walk can often end up with things like dyslexia. So it's actually really important to keep track of this stuff. And so when I had Jacob in 2001, I wrote it all down. It's quite simple. Then fast forward 11 years to 2012, and I had my second child, Alex. And all of a sudden I started writing it all down again and um, I was, was actually my second, my second marriage. I was very happily married. All of a sudden, Alex got extremely sick and we ended up in hospital. He was only three months old. We ended up in hospital and the nurses were asking me how many wet nappies he'd had that day. I had no idea it was on a piece of paper at home. I had no idea. They were asking me this because they wanted to see if he was hydrated. Was he drinking enough? I didn't know. And I looked at my sister, who's a midwife, and I said, surely there's an app for this now. It's 2012. And she works at Gosford Hospital, a large public hospital, and she said, actually, no. We get a lot of mums coming with these contraction timers, which drive us midwives crazy, um, but we don't see anyone coming in with tracking apps like you're talking about. And so I spent the next week or so while we were in hospital researching, and I did find one very American app that talked about moms and diapers, and I found one other app that was very clunky uh, and didn't really work very well. And so at that point in time, with the IT skills that would fit on the outside of a corn kernel, I decided that I would create an app. And so I set about researching and working out exactly what I wanted this app to do. And so I'm gonna show you a quick video now of exactly what that app does do baby diaries.
created by mums who understand. Don't miss a step of your child's growth with The Baby Diaries. So you can imagine me going from someone with no tech skills whatsoever and an idea to something like that actually took quite a bit of work. It took actually around nine months. So the first part of that nine months was finding the right people, um, getting some quotes. For me, it was about learning as much as I could about wireframes, user interface, user experience, and just really understanding exactly what went into developing an app without getting bogged down in the tech. Um, really knowing what it was that I was good at, and that was about being creative and connecting with people and knowing what I wasn't good at and what I didn't want to learn, and that was the tech. And getting people on my team who were really good at that stuff. And that's what I went about doing. Um, it's one thing to have a really good idea and to develop an app. Oops. Welcome what? to Baby Diaries, your fun and simple interactive app. It's another thing that goes by, but... to get people to actually use it. So the biggest challenge for me next was actually standing out from the crowd because very quickly, it was 2012, apps were coming out by the thousands every day. And so within a blink of an eye, we went from three baby tracking apps in the app store to hundreds of baby tracking apps. And they were being bought out by people who had millions of dollars in marketing advertising. And so here I was, Tara in Newcastle, with my great baby tracking app, with very little marketing budget. So how do I stand out from the crowd and actually get people to download it all over the world when I'm competing with Huggies with their baby tracking app and you know what to expect when you're expecting with their baby tracking app? I learned very quickly, the very first lesson in all of this was the only thing that made me different from everyone else was my personal story. So the only way I could stand out from the crowd was actually to tell my personal story so that people would remember me and my story. So instead of putting out really bland PR and bland media releases to the Sydney Morning Herald and to the Today Show and to Newcastle Herald about this app and how great it was and the features of the app, I actually had to tell my story. And the fact that I was a mum and I had an 11 year gap, the fact that I had postnatal depression when I had my first child and I used to write everything down so that it made me feel better. And so when I had my second child and I didn't have postnatal depression, but he ended up in hospital, I thought, wow, I don't have postnatal depression, but I've got this really sick baby and I'm really tired. And if I could make things easier for me, imagine what I could do for women with postnatal depression right now. And so I put that media release out and a local journo rang me and she liked the story and she started asking me some really personal questions. And I was answering quite naively at the time, quite honestly, because there's part of this story I haven't told you yet. So I was answering and thinking it was okay to tell her exactly what was happening in my life. The next day, I was thinking she would tell that story about depression. And I was thinking, how am I going to cope when the Newcastle Herald writes a story about the fact that 12 years ago I had postnatal depression? It's okay, I'll be all right. The story she actually wrote that ended up going viral, the story she actually wrote was the truth, which was that when Alex was two months old in 2012, I came home one day and I walked up the stairs and I opened my front door and my house was empty because my husband, who had very severe mental health issues, had a psychotic episode and left. That was six years ago. We've never seen him since and that's okay. Um, but the reality was I'd actually become a single mum overnight. I didn't have depression, but God, I was tired and I was in a really bad state. And so when he ended up in hospital and they asked me how many wet nappies he had and I didn't know, I thought, wow, imagine all those women who are depressed, how are they coping? I'm just a single mum right now. I'm not depressed. I'm not in any dark place apart from being really tired. How are they coping? So that's actually why I created the app. I created the app because I wanted to help as many women out there as I can because I know that 80% of every woman who has a baby ends up with the baby blues. I know that. And I know that a really large percentage of those women end up with postnatal depression. And I know that 25 women in Australia every year kill themselves because they're that depressed. 
And if I can create a tool that will help them feel like they're in some form of control and it actually can help them, then I'll do that. And that's what I did. So that was the story. So I can tell that story now and I can see the power behind that story at the time I couldn't see it. But this is what happened. The story went viral. Everyone wrote that story. So I had to get my head around the fact that all of Australia was reading my story, that all of a sudden it, the two month old baby I became a single mother. But it went viral and, and that's just a tiny splattering of the people who wrote my story. And then, of course, it ended up on the Today Show. And that's when the game changed. So Carl and Lisa, at the time, and Joe Abbey, talked about my app on the Today Show. They talked about it for five minutes. They talked about the fact that it was an Aussie mum that invented it. Thank God they didn't tell my story. <laughs> I was a bit happy about that. That day, the amount of downloads of my app were phenomenal. It was out of control. So that's when things changed. But the other lesson that I learned from this is that as much PR as you can ever get, it only lasts for 48 hours. So PR is an amazing tool, but it lasts for 48 hours. So what comes after PR? What did I learn next? Marketing partnerships. Now, I am so passionate about partnerships. I could sit here and talk about them for hours. Literally, my whole business has been built on the back of partnerships. The first lot of partnerships that I went after were co-marketing partnerships. And the very first one that I attracted was with Jim Baru. So if you haven't heard of Jim Baru, it's a program for zero to four or five-year-olds. It's where you take them and they learn all sorts of sensory development stuff. They learn to crawl before they can walk. They go through tunnels. It's, it's one of those fabulous programs. It's all about children's sensory development and confidence development. There are around 500,000 children in these programs just in Australia alone. It's a really successful program here. I happen to know the owner of the Warners Bay Gym Baru, So I contacted her and said, hey, would you mind just handing out my brochures? to your mums. My brochures were the same size and shape as an iPhone. She said, I can do better than that. Why don't I introduce you to the national marketing manager? Perfect. It just so happened that they were on the, on the verge of launching an online program, which was basically like a taster. People who didn't think that they could afford Jimbaru or they didn't know about it, it was an online free taster. So the national marketing manager said, well, what if you promote our online program for us? and we'll promote your app for you. Okay, great, win-win. So they promoted my app to their half a million mums for free. And I promoted their online program to my growing database of you know, people who loved my app. Fabulous partnership, amazing. The next one, who is now a beautiful friend of mine, Tina Harris. Lala's one of the top ranking shows on ABC Kids. She's just broken into the US market. When I met her though, she was just starting out. She's basically like the Wiggles, for those of you who remember the Wiggles. Same deal, same target market. So we said to each other, why don't we just promote each other? We're both trying to grow. We both have exactly the same target market. We're not competitive. Let's just promote each other. So that's what we did. A sleep consultant who has a book. I promoted her book. And to every mum and dad who came in who had sleep problems with their baby, she said, here's an app. Use this app to track your baby's sleep. When you come back, we'll have a look at the app and see what's going on with your baby's sleep. And I kept doing that over and over again with anyone I could find in Australia who shared the same target market with me. It was a win-win. Then I found people who wanted to give things away. The first one was a hospital bag for mums who were going into hospital. So I did a big giveaway through my social and my database of one of her hospital bags, and she put my brochure into every hospital bag that she sold for the next 12 months. Every single mum that went into hospital with one of her bags got my brochure. I did exactly the same with these nappy bags, did a big giveaway, and they put my brochure into every single nappy bag they sold for the next 12 months. And then I did the same with Bob Long Buddies, and they promoted me to their online database. And then I realised I really needed a 
start a newsletter that was full of content that I could never write myself. I'm not an expert when it comes to babies, I've only had two. So I found a product called Cozy Go, which is all about traveling safely with children. She wrote some content for me. I top and tailed it. So I introduced her product and then I put links to her product and she gave me the content that I could send to my database. Then I met these people who own an online midwifery company. So they not only wrote my blogs for a year for me, they also changed all of their blogs. So whenever they talked about breastfeeding, they had a hyperlink to my app. Whenever they talked about nappy changing, they had a hyperlink to my app. Whenever they talked about anything, they had a hyperlink to my app. And I did the same with another lady who had all these blogs about keeping the house tidy and cleaning with natural products. Marketing partnerships were the key to that first couple of years of success. Next lesson came along really fast. Overnight, no one wanted to pay for apps anymore. Everyone wanted apps for free. So that was around the time that I identified the very first moment of value of depth. It's like people just stopped buying apps in the app store. They just expected they'd be free. So what do we do? What do we do? We pivot as fast as we possibly can with our business model. So I went from a a B2C business model, a business to consumer business model, to a B2B business model literally overnight. I went, I cannot give my app away for free and not have any income. How can I possibly monetize this product? So I thought about the other partnerships that I'd had. They were all marketing partnerships that were free, but they were distribution partnerships. And that was when I thought, if I could get a really big distribu distribution partnership on board where they paid me for the app, so it looked like it was their app and they distributed it, that would work. So I contacted Terry White, before they were Terry White Kemmer, and I said to them, if you had an app that you gave to every single one of the expectant and new mums that came into your pharmacy, they had to sign up to your membership program, so you're collecting their email addresses, you're getting new members on board. You can send them push notifications straight to their hand, because we all know that the brochures you put in people's letterboxes go from their letterbox to their recycle bin. Mums are really busy, they don't have time to read them anyway, and even if they did, they're so tired, they're not gonna remember what was in the brochure. Imagine if you could mark it straight to their phone. Imagine if at two o'clock in the morning, mums are feeding their baby and they've actually got your app on their phone with your brand. You become part of their healthcare journey. You're no longer advertising to them, you're actually helping them. And they loved it. I said it will be yours. You'll have it exclusively for the first three years. So you can be the only pharmacy in the world with an app like this. The back end of the app has a marketplace where you can sell, you can promote, you can educate, you can push your blogs, you can push whatever you like. And they said yes at the very first meeting. They signed a three year contract, which did take a long time because legals got involved. And we're still in that contract, we have another year to go. So they pay me an annual license fee to have ownership in Australia of the Baby Diaries in terms of the brand. And it's working really well. So at the moment, they merged with Ken Marty in the middle. They now have around 3 million members in, in Australia and 460 retail stores. And the app goes out through all of those retail stores and the database is building and it's successful. It's a really good success story. What that allowed me to do was to go back to the beginning and say, well, what do I do next? I can do the same thing in other markets, which I have been trying to do, but I'd also like to do the same thing with pets. I have a pet and we all treat our pets like babies. So I created the Pet Diaries which launches next week. Why did I create the Pet Diaries? 65% of all households have pets. Pets are a 12 billion dollar industry in Australia and that's just household direct spend on pets. Households in the USA spent 87 billion dollars on their pets last year. It's a big market and there is no pet tracker. Healthy pets equal healthy humans. If we walk our pets, we get healthy too.
But the biggest lesson was that rinse and repeat is not a strategy. So what I tried to do was take, in November last year, take the baby diaries over to the US and the pet diaries and do exactly the same as we've done with Terry White in the US. And the biggest response over there was we can't afford it. The first response was we could do it ourselves. And so my response to we could do it ourselves internally is you could. It'll take you, you're a corporate, it'll take you 12 months probably to do all of your R&D, to get your wireframing done, to do all of the design work. You're going to be pulling staff off the floor from the jobs they're already doing, so there's opportunity cost. Then you'll have to pay probably 200,000 to get an app developed because you're a corporate, you'll have to pay more. Or you can have this in three months. We could do all of that for you. But it takes time. And so while I was there, I sat, I was actually just sitting one day thinking there has to be another way. And I have an app on my phone called MedAdvisor. And so if I go into Amcal Charlestown, they give me an activation code and it's, um, it says my med advisor has MCAL on the bottom. But if you go into Piggott's Pharmacy at Blackbutt, yours has Piggott's, but they're the same app. They're driven by an activation code. And so I thought I could do that with the baby diaries and the pet diaries. And we could actually give it to smaller retailers and give them competitive advantage against the corporates. And they could actually start giving these apps to their customers and communicate with their customers and we can segment the database based on activation code and these people can actually use apps like Terry White does but for $120 a month rather than spending $250,000 to go and build an app. And so that was what we came up with in December. It's called the subscriber model, this is it here. We launch that next week. We've actually got um, quite a few people in the US already interested, some franchises over there getting ready, which is exciting. Um, so we've still got this model, we have another tiered model coming out and we have still the white label model. Um, but certainly just because it works in one market doesn't mean it will work in another. And I found that out in December. So as I said, rinse and repeat is not a strategy, it's about constantly being ready, expecting things won't work and being ready to change. Has anyone read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? It's a really good little book about making sure you're ready for when all of your cheese is gone. It's about these little mice who expect that the cheese will always be there. And then all of a sudden the cheese is gone and they all respond very differently. And instead of, instead of going and finding new cheese, one of them just keeps going, well, someone needs to bring me some more cheese. My cheese is gone, bring me more. And no one's gonna bring you more cheese. You have to go and find new cheese. And, and I guess this is what this is about. It's about going, well, things change. I have to find new cheese. It's about when people stop paying for apps in the app store. Things, things change. How do we do it differently? So from all of that, my biggest lessons, I guess, out of the last <coughs> six years. The thing I didn't talk about was my financial model and I'm still doing it solo. So from day one, I've never had an investor. From day one, I have never had uh, grant funding. From day one, I haven't had venture capitalists. And there have been many times where I've gone, what am I doing? Um, and there have been many times where I should have. There have been many times where I could have. And there are still times where I think maybe I still should. Um, and it's something I toy with all the time. Um, but at this point in time, I'm still going solo. Cash flow is a constant issue, and I think if you ask any business at any point in their journey what one of their key challenges are, it'll be cash flow, and it certainly is for me. Cash flow is my biggest challenge. It is my biggest challenge. My other biggest challenge is putting a moratorium on ideas, and I think you'll also find that a lot of entrepreneurs have the same issue. I need one of those big red no buttons. No, stop brain. I need an off button on my brain because I have too many ideas and so it's all about, I actually write them down now and put them in a book so that I don't feel like I'm dismissing them. Um, but it's about just making sure you focus on just a couple of things at a time rather than trying to do too many things at once. 
Having an export strategy from day one, I see a lot of people who really do limit their focus for their business, whether they limit, uh, particularly on digital, you know, don't limit, I say don't limit yourself to being regional or national, or when it's digital, it can be, you know, adapted to any market, really. And so having that export strategy from day one, I've found for me was quite important. One of the biggest challenges has been marketing a new to market product. So trying to show people that they need, so going to a Terry White was quite easy, but finding other businesses like that that are open-minded to digital marketing to the hands of their target market, I'm finding this sort of boardroom scenario more often than not, where they're saying, well, what if we don't change at all? Let's just put, keep putting catalogues in people's letterboxes and we've always done it that way. So we'll just keep doing it that way. So that's a huge challenge for me is actually trying to communicate the benefit of having an app for your business. The other big thing for me is about team and having the right people around you at the right time. Really making sure that you stretch yourself, put yourself out there and, um, you know, I, I was saying earlier, I don't always net, network locally that often, but I'm always very involved in a lot of national networks. I tweeted, um, I was actually taking the piss out of myself. I was reading a book called How to Create a Billion Dollar App by George Bukowski. And I was in the doctor's surgery reading this book and I looked around and all the other women were reading magazines. And so I took a photo of this book and I tweeted, what else would you read in the doctor's surgery? Taking the piss out of myself for being a bit of a nerd. And I hashtag Billion Dollar App, which is his hashtag. And the next morning I woke up and I had a private message from him. And he's created $4 billion apps. He said, hi Tara, George here. Thanks so much for checking out my book. I just checked out your app, The Baby Diaries, and wonder if we could catch up on Friday because I'm actually working on a baby project at the moment and I'll be heading over to Australia in December. And so we ended up Skyping. We actually Skyped again Monday night, just gone because his, his wife's having a baby soon. And since then we've built a relationship and we, he's actually going to be my distributor for the Baby Diaries and the Pet Diaries in the UK. I'm helping him get partnerships with Lala and others here in Australia for his latest project. Put yourself out there because you never know who's looking. And so vehicles like Twitter, anything like that, just put yourself out there. I was just actually having a go at myself for being a bit of a nerd, but look where it ended up. So, you know, making sure you stretch and Surround yourself with amazing people and amazing things happen and, you know, stay true to your sense of purpose, I think, is the key. Any questions? Thank you so much, Tara. That was amazing. <laughs> so how long, so was it 2012, you said, when you first came up with the idea for the app for the Baby Diaries, and when did that launch? Was it last year, did you say? No, the Baby Diaries first, I launched it under my own brand for the first time mm. in 2013. Oh, okay, right. And then the Terry White model came out in 2016. They, saw, they said yes in 2015. We launched in 2016. And now I have it in my own brand again in New Zealand and the US. Okay. Um, soon to be the UK. Okay, and so what advice would you give to people who have developed something like this that has opportunities for co-marketing or partnerships approaching a big organisation like a Terry White Chemist? Did you try to find an in or did you just cold call an email? What's your advice there? Uh, I first tried to find an in. So a warm contact is obviously, like the Jim Guru, I knew the local girl, she introduced me. Um, if you can't find a warm in, just, I didn't have a warm in to Terry White. I literally just emailed Anthony White, who's the CEO, um, and, and copied in the national GM. Um, talked to them, didn't give them a lot of information because they they're too busy. So really short, couple of sentences, said, look, I've got this opportunity. Um, I'm looking for like-minded businesses. I've come to you first, you know, let's chat. And how long were you over in the US for last year? Two weeks. And so obviously you'd set up all the meetings in advance and was that a similar situation where you had just emailed people in no, advance or? No, again, it comes back to that having reached out and the right people. So my friend Lala, Tina, um, when I got the Terry White 
deal, she rang me that day to see how it went. And she said, if you need a licensing agent, our licensing agent is fabulous. His name is Graham Grasby. So Graham was the licensing agent for the Wiggles and Bananas in Pajamas. And he's all about licenses. That's his thing. And so she said, I'll introduce you, which she did. Now, the thing she didn't tell me is that Graham's also extremely well known in the US for introducing the Wiggles to the US. Um, and you know he knows the Shopkins people, Thomas the Tank people, all of these people. And all of these people have uh, the same people who would want the baby diaries. And so he set up all of the meetings for me. That's fantastic. So it's about reaching out. Yeah. And just sometimes, I don't know, sometimes just get lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Firstly, congratulations on all your success. You. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking, you said that the idea came for you when you were in hospital with your son. Did you ever think of partnering with New South Wales Health? <laughs> no. No, I sh there's so many things I would do differently now. Okay. Um, certainly the funding of it, yeah, it was challenging, particularly now that you know the, the story, mm -hmm. um, because not only was my house empty, but so was my bank account. Mm -hmm. And so that was such a challenging time, such a challenging time, um, that you know funding the development of an app was challenging. And um, but you know what? Looking back on it, I learned how to do it so lean mm. that I can still do it. I can build an app so lean. I don't ever go offshore. That's mm -hmm. one of my rules. Yep. I never go offshore. Um, I have no tech skills. So adding language and time barriers to an already zero tech brain, that would not work for me. Yep. Um, my tech developers are in Melbourne, the two nicest guys you could ever meet. They're just lovely guys, um, both parents with pets. So they both actually understand what I'm trying to do. Yep. Um, but no, I'm, not, I'm currently developing another app called Our Care Journal, mm -hmm. and it is in partnership with government. Okay. And with QUT. Okay. And we own the IP, but they're funding it. QUT have put in $200,000 worth of um, of their time and IP, and they've done all of the, um, the co-design workshops for us. Queensland Government have funded it, and then we still maintain the IP. Okay. And is that more about healthcare? It's about keeping people in their own homes longer. Okay. Um, for chronically ill, uh, disabled elderly okay um, and it's about supporting the carers so that the carers can have respite yep. and be supported and it's a, there's actually a peer-to-peer -peer element of the app so that carers and other carers whether they're still caring or had cared so my mum for example cared for my dad while he was dying mm -hmm. and then her best friend while she died my mum's you know wants to go and help other carers mm -hmm. and support them and answer their questions Yep. Um, people like mum are in that circle, that network, to answer questions and support. I thought um, it's, it's an online peer group. On peer to peer, or they can actually hook up if they want to for a coffee. It's like Tinder for carers. Ah, okay. Hmm. Interesting. That's what we're sort of been toying around with yeah, uh, right. at Aboriginal Women that I was talking about. Yeah, well, I think there's a huge need for that. Mm -hmm. Out of That was the one big thing that came out of our um, co-design workshops okay. for, with the carers, was that they really needed support. They just felt really isolated and there were a lot of tears in those co-design workshops from the carers like they're just really struggling because weren't you saying earlier too that with that particular app idea you were thinking that it would be used more by the elderly person and then you sort of pivoted in that co-design that yeah, you actually know you need it for the carers about the person being cared for okay but very quickly it, it we pivoted through like 180 um to become, becoming an app for the carer and um, is that app live now? Well, it actually, developed. I think you can find it. It's, okay. it's um, in an MVP form, but it's live. Okay. Um, but it will be, it's been completely redesigned at the moment and will be formally launched in August. Okay. Mm. And those carers that are linking up, they can be anywhere in Australia, so it can just be a virtual meeting. Totally. Yeah, it would, n it would normally be virtual unless they just happen to be. Yeah. And you can look for people like, I've never been on Tinder, but apparently the same as you can look for people in your area. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, okay. And what's the financial model for that? What's the business model for that particular app? They're twofold. One is a white label, 
Um, and the other one is the subscriber model. Okay. So, so someone like Novacare could have it mm -hmm. and use it for their people going out into people's homes, or someone else could actually advertise their products and services through the back. But we're going. It's very much about aligned businesses. So we're going to be very careful about screening who can and who can't advertise. Mm. Which I sort of I am as well. So my background I was actually at the CEO of kind of wetland centre for eight years. Okay. So my background is very eco. So I'm also quite careful about who I allow to advertise in the baby diaries. Yeah, that's what I was interested in mm. as well. When we've been thinking about commercialisation, if we get to, or when hopefully we get to that point, yeah, making sure that that partnership is. It has to be values aligned. Yeah. Or I feel yucky. Yeah. There are plenty of values aligned organisations out there. Mm. So it's, it's not hard. Mm. This is fabulous in um, New Zealand actually. Um, organisation over there that's just hooked up with Kimberly Clark to create some um, recycled plant for disposable nappies. So they're recycling them. Um, I mean, recycle, disposable nappies have been a huge mm. issue for decades mm. um, in terms of landfill. And so now they're able to recycle them, which is great. Mm. With your um, speech with your app, like how do you go about working with the customer and identifying what features and what not to develop? So co-design workshops, um, usually with people that I know. Um, so when I developed the Baby Diaries, I was in my 40s. So that was a bit harder <laughs> because of, obviously everyone else had children my other son's age. Um, and so I went to like a preschool and talked to them and because Alex was a baby so I went to his preschool and um, spoke to a lot of home daycare sort of um, ladies who would, and just asked them what sort of features they would want um, and then they asked their mums and so it was just about asking actual mums what, what would you use, what wouldn't you use, we got rid of a lot of features. Um, pets was really easy because everyone I know has a dog or a cat, really easy. There were things in there that I thought they'd want that they didn't. But in the pets, it came down to um, just simplifying. I didn't mention the fact that I've got a, I have um, a partnership with Fitbark for pets, which is owned by Fitbit. So it's you put it on your dog, and um, you can see if your dog's getting enough exercise for its breed and its age. And then, but what it does, it's like any behaviour modification tool. So once you start seeing, oh my goodness, Bentley, my dog, isn't getting enough exercise, you start walking the dog more, which is great for you. And so I love that about the, the app. Um, but yeah, so we looked at, so it, the pet diaries, you store when your vaccinations are due, um, medications, you can keep photos of the medications if you're going on holidays and someone else is looking after your dog, it tells them exactly when all the meds are due if you've got a dog on meds. Uh, allergies, a lot of dogs and cats are allergic to stuff. Um, exercise gets tracked in there, nutrition gets tracked in there if you want to. Uh, what else gets tracked in there? And then there's just the usual like photos, memories, milestone, weight, all that sort of stuff. What were the things that surprised you that you thought people would want but they didn't? Uh, I thought that they'd want to measure like the dog's growth mm -hmm. over time from like just overkill. Yeah. Um, Could nearly track the history of the animal as well. Oh, the other thing that is coming, which will be coming in October, is um, GPS tracking. So it, it'll be integrated into the Fitbar. It's so that I've got a dog that escapes a lot, and so in s my phone will alert. I'll set up a geofence, and then if he's outside of that area that I have predefined. I'll get an alarm to my phone, open the app, and I can literally watch where he's going, which will be to the Blackbird Hotel, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's where he goes. He goes to the Blackbird Hotel. We never go to the Black. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway. So and was yes. the baby diary app the same? That you started off with all these different ideas, and then just talking to people, you found out what yeah. they would like. And then it's also about using software like Firebase, which is um, a Google product okay. that I can actually see well which. Um, which features people not using, and then oh, over time okay. just sort of once they downloaded your app, you could track what features they used. Yeah. Okay. So 
So I've had to upskill my tech brain a little. Has it changed a lot, the app, since you first? It's changed a bit. I'm in the process of putting some Premi baby um, World Health Organization graphs in because they're new mm -hmm. and they weren't available when I first developed it. But no, I'm not, you know, babies are the same. Yeah. They haven't changed much. We're still measuring and, and tracking the same sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the only other thing, like I add features like being able to, like in the pet diaries, you can actually list all of your pet contacts, your groomer, your vet, your everything. Um, and then click on the contact to make an appointment straight with them, whether email, mm -hmm. website, or phone. So it's all, it's basically your pet's life simplified yeah. in one app. Mm -hmm. So I've consolidated a lot of things inside the app. Mm -hmm. For the Baby Diaries app, is, do you hear from mothers about them using that to show to their, uh, their health checkups instead of the Blue Book? Or? They have to take the Blue Book yep. for a certain amount of time, mm. but they, they are taking the app for things like sleep, um, you know, is this normal? Yeah. That's what particularly the Terry White health nurses are seeing. The, the mums go, is my baby sleeping enough? Yeah, okay. Because everyone's tired. <laughs> Everyone thinks their baby doesn't sleep enough. Um, nappies, because our baby tracker now has poo colour. Because um, a lot of mums used to, when you your baby comes out first, the colours of the poo is quite Weird. Weird. And then when you introduce solids, the poo colour just is weird. And so we got um, a doctor to help us develop the actual medical poo colours. And um, a couple of, like, red is not a good, unless you're feeding your baby beetroot, you don't want red poo. So things like that are really good um, for the mums to be able to track and then show the doctor allergic reactions to foods so they can actually correlate mm -hmm. um, and prove. Because a lot of doctors will just be like, oh, well, you know, they've got a rash on their bottom every time they eat watermelon. I'm sure it's just just a rash. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, well, no, look, <laughs> we can show you. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite useful for that. Um, yeah. I think it sounds like you've done the job in terms of being able to make mum's lives a little bit easier, even if it's just to put their mind at ease that, you know, be able to show a doctor or a healthcare practitioner that here's the information. Yeah. and validating their anxiety or, you know, I guess, or at least, you know, bringing their mind at ease when their doctor says, no, that's completely normal. Just keeping track. Mm. I just find, I found, and I know a lot of mums find, just keeping track. And the research shows us now that, that mums with postnatal depression, keeping track of their day eases their anxiety. Mm. So I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. We're going to have to wrap up because we're nearly at the hour, but thank you so much, Tara. That was fantastic. Thank you.